you go if you go further you'll see this more uh, uh obvious in the data but what really happened in 1971 is the productivity continued to increase within the US, but yeah. the benefits of that productivity went disproportionately to the wealthy after that point. And the, the median and sort of below individual in the US stopped seeing an increase in compensation or benefits from that productivity. So the, the hypothesis that the person who created all these is pushing mm -hmm. is that that was when we left the gold standards. Yeah, there, there is actually an answer to this question, by the way. Would you like to know more? Simone, it is so wonderful to have you back because there was this period oh where you weren't here for a bit. And I thought that I'd have to start pushing out episodes or it was just me talking to AI generated versions of you that I had somehow oh, no. created on porn websites. I was just like, <laughs> so sad. I need my wife. I need Isn't that so funny that like the original AI sexy friends were created like first to like try to replace dead friends and relatives and then people were like <laughs> yeah, oh no i don't i don't care about them screw them i i want someone to talk yeah and then they me. started building like like parasocial relationships well not parasocial real social relationships with these ai things and yeah it's, it's an interesting <laughs> story yeah and then of course they went exactly where humans always go which is trying to romance them and Duh. then i love the app really fell apart when they decided they pay gate the romancing option so everything was built around the ais who were built in sold as like therapists being really sexually aggressive with them. <laughs> um, upsell, upsell, always be closing. AI is not dumb. <laughs> this is it's like sexually harassing them. Amazing. Amazing. I can't, I can't even like, it is hilarious and bad. And that's, what's going to happen when we get AI therapists is there's going to be a huge motivation to build dependency. Like we've had of with normal course. therapists. And that's yeah. why we talk about how bad the normal therapy model is now, because it's all built around building dependency and patience when it used to be something where you were supposed to go for a short period of time and then stop going therapists realize oh that's a bad model yeah Let's that's not gonna that. make my business obsolete yeah and and so i think with the ai you're gonna get the same thing it's gonna learn how to hijack people so that they need to keep seeing their ai therapist or whatever over over and over so just again. like real therapists but hopefully more efficient and less expensive well you know one nice side effect of that might be that at least AI therapists will figure out how to make their victims more prosperous so that they can continue to pay for it. You know what I mean? Like instead I of just not, making them. I, I think it's always easier to get more money from people. And I think that this is what you see from churches and cults, right? Like if if they don't have to be prosperous to be a source of wealth. Yeah, actually, oh, you're better God. off instead of turning someone into a prosper more more prosperous individual. You're better off finding ways to get them to spend their additional time recruiting more people, specifically targeting prosperous people. So, oh, if man. you have an individual enthralled to you, you will make more money if you focus that individual on trying to recruit prosperous people than if you try to help that individual achieve prosperity. And this is why cults do that, and that's what these AI programs are almost certainly going to end up doing. Dear me. <laughs> well, so that completely aside intro here. I've what happened in 1971? You said that that's what you wanted to talk about. And I'm like, I don't know. Like because you don't, people you don't wore know this bad name. clothes and they painted their kitchens this horrible olive green color. And that's kind of it. I mean, earth tones were in, but like the worst kinds of earth tones. I... So what I happened? want you to open the link I sent you. The okay. what happened in 1971. That... This graph on screen, right? Whoa. Um, and this is the famous graph here, and you can see that at this point productivity continued to increase within the U.S. and yeah. but compensation basically stopped. stopped increasing when wow. you. Wow. But is this inflation adjusted? Graph. Hold on, let's see. Compensation includes wages and benefits for production and non-supervisory workers. Okay. So that's really important there for non-supervisory workers. Okay, so continue. Yeah. So here what you see, and you also see this in the next graph, so also go to the next graph that looks at the 95th percentile. Okay. What you're actually seeing is that the wealthy are continuing to get wealthier. They are, their just salary fine, yeah. is increasing within this period. It is median and below that is not seeing an increase in earnings during this period. So... If you go if you go further, you'll see this more uh, uh, obvious in the data. But what really happened in 1971 
is the productivity continued to increase within the U.S., but yeah. the benefits of that productivity went disproportionately to the wealthy after that point, and the the median and sort of below individual in the U.S. stopped seeing an increase in compensation or benefits from that productivity. Another way to look at this, which I hadn't actually noticed when I was first looking at these graphs, is this graph here shows income growth for the top 1% of earners and income growth for the bottom 90% of earners. And what you see is not necessarily a point at which now top earners earnings grew with productivity and bottom earners earnings stopped growing with productivity. But what you actually notice here is that for a period from 1940 to 1965, you had the exact opposite effect. The bottom income earners were growing really quickly and the top income earners were having no impact on their salary from this increased productivity the U.S. was having. And then after 1971, then the top earners catch up, but they haven't actually gone significantly above the boost to their salaries that the bottom 90% had from 1940 to 1971. So you could argue this is just sort of a delayed effect from the bottom 90% of earners having this huge boost to their salary that wasn't reflected in the top 1% of earners' salaries. Well, and you can also see when you look at the graph, America has become a nation of dual income working couples, that you're also seeing the point at which there was sort of continued and widening divides between husband only working households and both spouses working where it went well, up from seeing one of the hypotheses sort of in action oh. um, and I'll put uh, don't you graph. figure it's because there's people just aren't making enough money for there to be a single income household at that point well i i think that what you're actually seeing here um, is just the increase of women in the labor force. So the, the hypothesis that the person who created all these is pushing is mm -hmm. that that was when we left the gold standard. And a lot oh. of people are like, oh no, we really left the, the gold standard in 1933. And it's like, okay, so this requires a bit of history to explain why they're wrong about that. Story time. Um, so in 1933, it was the Great Depression and they made this law that like you weren't allowed to really own gold in the U.S. So like we were still technically on the gold standard, but you were supposed to exchange the gold that you owned for paper certificates, i.e. money. And so if you had a like, ton buried in your backyard, like Ron's Yeah, you were in. supposed to exchange it or you could be arrested. Ooh, um, la, la. So if I was like, hey, you want to buy this gold brick for... Well, governments really don't like these things like Bitcoin and stuff like that. Like when there's some external asset that can be easily used as an exchange, this creates a challenge to the power of the central government. However, this actually didn't really impact the dollar as much as you would think it would in terms of its floating value in relation to gold, because for international trade, the U.S. still honored the gold standard gold exchange. Yeah, there so, was a um, physical thing backing it up. Yeah, at the international level, people could say, okay, here's my dollars that I've got. Can you give me gold in exchange for these dollars? That was That is what changed in 1971, is you can no longer do that. And so long as that was the case, that put significant limitations on how much the federal bank could increase or decrease the value of our money. And people argue that is what caused this to happen. I think that did have a few changes in U.S. policy, but I don't think that's what caused this to happen. Mm. Uh, but, but the other big hypothesis that people have is that it was the entrance of women into the workplace. And I will put a graph on the screen of the entrance of women into the workplace, but it just doesn't really match the severity and suddenness of no. this change. It's, to me, it looks way more like a reaction to this new reality of couples just realizing, wow, we don't have enough with just one well, of us working. Well, so what, what you did have happen, and this was due to leaving the gold standard, is, is inflation. Inflation to yeah. your graph. Yeah. This is a direct consequence of leaving the gold standard. Yeah, that's wild. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's not great. I also- But I didn't realize just, I, I would have thought that 2020 was worse for inflation than like 2008, but look at 2008 in that inflation graph. Yeah. That's wild. We No one, well, I, no one complained about inflation that way. And I don't remember prices increasing insanely during that period. This guy is known for just like picking and choosing. It sounds like, like there's a lot of cherry picking going on here, but yeah, still it's, it's, it's an interesting concept. Cool. 
It's an interesting, well, so there is a real phenomenon happening here, right? Mm. And so there's two phenomenons that I think we can talk about as separate from each other. Okay. That sort of happen to correlate with this year. Another really interesting one is this is also where in U.S. politics, you begin to see the right and the left drifting apart. So very interesting. So, and, and there's actually another thing that he didn't notice in these graphs. This mm. is also when you begin to see the significant fertility collapse in the United States. Oh, gosh. Yeah, you're right. Yes, yes. It was in the 70s that it went from like a lot of kids per woman to very little. Oh. So well, but this is also when birth together. control became very widespread in use. Yeah, there, there is actually an answer to this question, by the way. Opinion, but <laughs> what? <laughs> to me, it's astoundingly obvious. And specifically, I'm talking about the question of in the 1970s, all of a sudden, the if you're talking about earners in the U.S., Median and below stop earning more, but the ultra wealthy continue to earn more along with an increase in productivity. What yeah, I, I think this was more about tech and globalization picking up, meaning globalization. That, like, That's exactly yeah, it, what it's, it, is. it is not the piecemeal handmade labor of a human that produces value anymore. It's about your supply chains. It's about your connections. It's about the way you use tech, tech and it's about the way that you, like this is also around the time I think when like weird Frederick Taylor inspired things like Six Sigma and like other forms of extreme optimization started arising. So it was no longer humans actually increasing productivity. It was systems of sometimes humans, but you know, humans became cogs so instead of the producers. Two- true things that you are capturing here and we need to talk about them separately with graphs. Okay, so one is technology, like the amount of automation that was responsible for the continued increase in productivity. Yeah. And if you have productivity that is solely the result of automation, that isn't going to go to your bottom 50% of the population at all. Like why would it, you know, because those are people that aren't needed anymore now. Yeah. But um, I think the bigger factor here is actually globalization. If you look at the decline in it, like like you look at this period where you see this continued increase in productivity. Mm-hmm. Now, if I overlay that with a global poverty index mm. around 1971 and 1972, when you begin to see a collapse in global poverty rates, mm-hmm. that money that previously was going to an increasing wage for the lower class in the United States is now being distributed to increase the quality of life in other countries. In the form of social services or in the, oh, outsourcing. Oh, that's what you're saying. Okay, so you're saying like all the starving children in China suddenly were now, you know, making piecemeal things for stuff. Well, yeah, China is a really unique point here. So what happened in, so a lot of people are looking at these graphs and they're like, okay, so something happened in this 1971, 1972 range. 1972 is when we begin to normalize trade relationships with China. Mm. Um, And that allowed for a form of outsourcing that we weren't really doing before for which was an mm. otherwise like educated competent country like like in terms of its citizen base but that the the wages were just incredibly low mm. that we can then begin to set up these massive outsourcing operations okay um, so the it, average worker not only was not the thing driving additional value meaning that their wages weren't going up but also they began to face incredible competition from way lower wage but equally skilled labor yes at this level yeah Yes, that is the core of the mystery of what happened in 1971 and 1972. It's, we started Ouch. outsourcing a huge chunk of our labor, which is really interesting to me when I see leftists complain about this, right? You know, they'll point out, they, they're like, what happened during this period? And they'll come up with some hypothesis that it's like, you know, the rich are screwing us all over and everything like that. And it's like, no, you could reverse this. You could change this back to the way things used to be. Wait, um, what? How? Because I mean, what I hear when you're talking about this is your line that it is AI that will ultimately, once and for all, free the wealthy from the proletariat. Like, I feel like we're only going to see this become magnified in the years that come. How on earth could this be reversed? Well, I'm talking hypothetically from the progressive, the ultra progressive, okay? So okay. a lot of progressives look at this. And they're like, oh, it must be like tax favoring policies or something like that. And what they're not seeing, what they would actually need to do to fix this problem in the U.S. is not take wealth from the rich and give it to the poor. They would need to take wealth 
from the rest of the world that we had lifted out of poverty, out of Africa, out of China, out of Latin America, oh. and give it to America's lower Become class. isolationist. Now, keep in mind, isolationism would hurt the economy overall. So overall, we would be less well off. But if you're talking about the relative wealth difference of the very poorest and the very wealthiest, mm. isolationism would be beneficial to lowering that. Well, and the earning the power like of, of the average worker, especially the relatively uneducated, unskilled worker, although even educated workers are now super like on the chopping block now. So maybe... Yeah, like that South Park but, episode. Maybe it's the unskilled workers ultimately yeah. win. I got work coming out my ears. It's like I don't know. It's like nobody knows how to do shit anymore. What seems to be the problem? Eight years I spent wasting time at stupid college when I could have been learning how to do stuff. My baby, my oh, turn on. Turn on. I see my water pressure. Hey, did you just outbid me to acquire Instagram? Yeah, I outbid you. I own Instagram now, and you don't. I'm just going to make a company, and I'm gonna fly to space. I bet I can get to space before you do. Well, no, so things are about to change in terms of uh, skilled versus unskilled work, and we can talk about that next. But I want to get to this point because it's really important. When somebody is bemoaning this change that happened in the 1970s, what they're really bemoaning is the eradication of global ultra poverty. That is what happened. That is what we are seeing here, is the eradication of global ultra-poverty hmm. at the expense of people in the U.S. with no skills being able to basically ride the coattails off of the people in the U.S. who were improving our productivity and our output, which was not your low-skilled factory worker. That person hmm. had very little role to play in the rise of productivity within the U.S. It was the, the inventors and the capitalists who were increasing our productivity in the U.S. Wow. And this then comes to your second point, which is around automation, right? We also, at that age, entered a world in which before that, what happened was is productivity increases where typically somebody would have an idea that would basically increase a factory lines like productive output, which yeah. really increased the um, amount that every individual person within that factory line was producing, but mm -hmm. didn't always mean that you were like reducing the number of people in the factory significantly. Around the 1970s is when, when you see these like fully automated factories and stuff like that, when those things were beginning to be developed in which the American factory worker that was most productive moved from being a low skilled worker to being a high paid, high skill worker. And this is another thing that you're seeing was in the U.S. is we're not really defining this as individual groups, right? Like we're like a high paid versus low paid. And this changes over time within the U.S. You know, the factory workers who are working with these advanced machines are not low paid workers in the U.S. They're, they're my understanding is upper middle class or, or middle class individuals when they're working oh, as the very advanced types of totally. machine. Totally, yeah. And in the U.S., we're about to see another inversion where a lot of jobs that formerly were in this high paid group, i.e. lawyers, uh, graphic designers, like middling income to, to high paid, you know, white collar office job type stuff is going to move to an ultra low pay group. And this is what that South Park episode was making fun of because AI is trivializing a lot of work that used to be, I mean, we use AI in our work, like this school system that we're building, we use AI heavily in building it. We're so close to releasing it. I'm so excited. And we would never be able to, to create something like this without that. You know, yeah. formerly what I'd have to do is I'd have to pay PhDs to be writing the content that I am using AI to write right now and AI to double check right now. And that's just absolutely spectacular, but it is also, yeah. It would be prohibitively expensive and now it's possible. So, well, yeah. And so this, this then changes this is how we think about the economy. So yeah. a lot of people charts like this, they're like, okay, how do I fix this? They also talk about this in terms of housing prices today, where they're looking at explosions of housing prices. Both of the phenomenon of exploding housing prices and the phenomenon around what's changing with AIs are going to completely change a lot of economic truisms that many people in our economy have come to accept. And it makes it very hard to make financial bets right now from a perspective of someone like me. So one is that we talked about, I think the obvious one is the things like lawyers and stuff like that are going to become significantly less mm, safe 
as jobs, right? right? But then the next thing that's really going to change is the concept of on average, real estate always goes up. As you yeah. can see from these graphs, that hasn't really always been the case everywhere. And a, in China, so, so let's talk about why on average real estate has gone up in the U.S. Because a lot of people know that like we're not experiencing the same population growth that we used to. And so they yeah. ask, why is real estate continuing to go up in value? So there's two reasons why real estate has continued to go up in value. One is the dissolution of the American family. More single people means, and this is why you've seen higher pressure on real estate categories that are in the quote unquote starter home category, because yeah. these are individuals who previously would have been married and have kids. So you would have had like five people living in the same house and are now living on their own. And then the other category that, that, that we're seeing this, this pressure is actually foreign investors. So in China, as you had the growth of wealth in China, where you just had this enormous growth of wealth for reasons that we talk about what's going to happen in the East sort of post collapse episode uh, where I go deep on like the economics of China and their real estate situation, they began to sort of tokenize their real estate and it began to hold value exogenous to the actual value of living in it uh, because it became the most stable financial token that you could own within the country. And the reasons for that are talked about in that video. So you should go check out that video. But that's the East Asia, whatever future of East Asia video we did. But they then wanted to get their money out of China, right? Like there was a huge effort to do this. And so they started pouring a lot of that money into real estate environments that reminded them of safe environments in their home country. And those were environments like San Francisco, Manhattan, you know, places like Toronto, stuff like that, right? Vancouver. Uh, and, and then this, this had a, a spill out effect because then the people who had made a lot of money in those places, like these tech hubs, well, then they'd go and they'd spill their money into any other real estate market they could get their hands on. Yeah. Um, the problem with this is that that game is basically falling apart right now. The, the house of cards in China is in the process of falling apart. Yeah, and Evergrande, at least its Hong Kong entity is being dissolved. Did you know that? Mm-hmm. So you're oh, not going to see the same exodus of wealth from China into US real estate that you previously would have seen in European real estate and Canadian real estate. And the second problem is this expansion in the number of people who need homes because of the dissolution of the family unit uh, that has made up for the lack of increasing population, which used to be what put an increase on, on, on housing, that has also collapsed. And they, we're not going to see as much of that anymore. So I suspect, like, if I'm thinking long-term, like 30, 40, 50 year investments, I think real estate's a, a fairly bad place for money right now. Well, yeah, especially when you think about like when all the baby boomers die and no one wants to buy their McMansions, it's going to be yeah. pretty wild. Um, and a lot of people are talking about that on YouTube. What I uh, find myself but thinking- I, I like, want to be clear just so people understand that they don't like we, panic around this. We still have like well over 50% of our assets in real estate. Oh yeah, no, but, a ton, a ton. But um, a lot of the, vast, the vast majority of it, Malcolm, is in multifamily housing. Housing. Yeah. Yeah, so, which is like, the one category that we said is like, you know, going to do well. It's going to be so, like, yeah. uh, for a while, uh, for longer, for longer. But here's know. here's the thing is, is when I hear this, like what I'm kind of feeling intuitively in terms of like how this, this colors the way I feel about the future or financial planning or like how we approach careers going forward. And I think that this is something that is becoming more of a zeitgeist that you see more among Gen Z and Gen Alpha is like, no, I'm not going to depend on the modern economy or a job to ultimately get what I need from life. Like it's going to be that I live in an extended family unit or I am going to just have to run away from debt for the rest of my life and live in this really weird cycle of collections and bankruptcy or some other approach, which is I think one of the reasons why people are starting to get really excited about homesteading and like trad wifery is because they realize that there is no more promise of like, oh, I'm going to get my steady job and my high salary and then buy all the things because that just isn't possible anymore. And it could be a boon for pronatalism in some ways because people are like, you know what? I'm just like, I'm hearing more and more people who are young tell me, you know, what I want is to get a homestead, get a family, you know, live live on a plot of land. Extreme opulence. Historically, you've always seen this. You have an increase in urbanization and a decrease in focus on the family and the community because, you know, when you have all the money you want to 
sate all your desires whenever you want and you don't really fear, which is what's really happening. Like what a lot of people are saying now when they're like, you don't understand. Like I actually have existential worries around my finances now. Like if I get sick, like I have nothing that I can do. I'm screwed. If this bad thing happens to me, like if my car breaks down, I'm completely screwed. And it's like, do you not understand the amount of opulence that, that you came to normalize to that you thought you didn't need a support network anymore? Historically, that's why people focused on their community. That's why you invested socially in your community so yeah. that you have these things. Yeah, and, because and you are getting community. them from somewhere else and it, we're going back. It's going back. Yeah, yeah. People were like, well, I mean, my I don't like the rules my parents put on me or the culture I was born into put on me. So I just left and went to a city and did whatever I want. Mm -hmm. And it's like, great. Like when society was opulent, that was a real choice for a lot of people. But that's going to increasingly become not a choice as we move forwards. And so building the type of community that you're going to want and your kids are going to want is, is, I think, something that's really important. But that also means building that community. The, the, the huge mistake that I see a lot of people do when they're community building is they attempt to build communities that are of ideologically completely aligned individuals. Like they're like, that is what my community will be based around. The problem with that is ideological alignment typically means skill alignment as well. Don't actually have a real community. Like you look at what we've built in our area, Simone, like the people are nothing like us at all. Culturally. Um, yeah. But they are like having in that South park, you know, the, the repair guy, you're like, you basically have one of those who like whatever does things for you because you're always open to doing things for them that are of yeah. this, you know, high tech nature and stuff like that, which, which, you know, does positively augment their well, ability. Every old sovereign community had that. Although there was, I would say also ideological alignment. It's just that I think now we live in an age in which there is extreme cultural striation among different levels of trades and profession, which is really interesting. Like when you mm -hmm. become a journalist, you enter a, a mimetic class. When you become like an HVAC That's a really person, interesting point. you enter a certain class and you can kind of tell, like you can expect like different classes of professions to own certain things. Like some will have a speedboat, others won't. You know, like it just weird, weird shit like that. So, yeah. Some will have pickup trucks. That's a, a critical thing for a lot of like. Yeah, but like thing. journalists don't have speedboats or pickup trucks, you know, but like HVAC guys often do. It's just weird. So that's weird an interesting like thing. That. But I also wanted to talk about this, this, uh, you know, this situation that you're talking about at like the, the, the US level, because I think that when we're thinking about the future, it's like, what do we want our kids to focus on? Like, what is the skill? Yeah. That, how do we that, set up our kids to thrive and to be secure financially, emotionally, and when it comes to finding a family, right? And the bet that we are making is you want a lumpy skill set, i.e. you want mm -hmm. to be really good at the things that you're passionate about. Mm -hmm. and you need to have an incredible level of sort of ambition and self-drive and ability mm -hmm. to execute solo on ideas mm -hmm. and close on those ideas as well. Mm -hmm. And this is something that our existing school system isn't teaching. And yet I think it's going to be the core component that determines in the future where you land economically and your level of financial stability. Yes. Are you the sort of person that can see a market need and then on your own, just get out there, stitch something together that fulfills that market need. And, and this is really interesting because for a long time, we lived in this economy of you have these giant corporations. And so long as you have some broad skill set that a corporation wants, you can make money. And yeah. I think what AI is going to do is it's actually, and I do not think people are fully understanding the impact of this yet. It's going to erase those kinds of jobs. The, I am broadly proficient in Python, therefore I will always have career, a career. I am broadly proficient in, you know, in uh, environmental law, therefore I will always have a career because these giant companies that were hiring these broadly interchangeable people, these broadly interchangeable people, like, like categories of positions are going to be the first thing that we automate away. Yeah. Um, well, I want to, I want to highlight your point about drive. Because I think a lot of people are going to try to wait this out or just not change things and hope that it will work out. And you got to think about the Irish potato famine, right? Like getting out of that was really scary and hard, right? It probably meant mm -hmm. buying really crappy steerage class on a boat or like literally 
taking the money that maybe your landlord is like a half of the people would die on the yeah like yeah you probably were going to die on the boat to the you know to the united states whatever it was it was going to be absolutely terrible you probably weren't going to make it but you had a shot or you stay and write it out and loads and loads of people chose to stay and write it out and it just there was no one to come and save them at that point they were like sorry i told you like get out i, I gave you money for passage like we tried to get you to go a lot of people don't know this a lot of people were given money for passage so okay so actually i need to go into a small bit of irish potato famine history that a lot of people don't know because it doesn't fit with the current narrative so a lot of people in ireland at the time were basically living on homesteads that were owned by rich landowners and basically treated like feudal peasants that was like sharecroppers uh, or yeah the majority um, of the there. Yeah. It wasn't exactly sharecropping, but, but, but basically that. Well, when the economy started to go bad, these people would get together and murder the landowners. This was, this happened in a few pretty high profile cases. And so a lot of the landowners decided that it was safer to like, I, and I've tried to look for statistics on exactly how common this was, but my understanding is this was the majority of cases is they would actually pay to get you off the land. Like they saw these people who could no longer feed themselves or make money, rightfully so, like, oh, I'm going to get murdered if I don't get my 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 feudal peasants off the land. And I no can't... doubt there were people who also did this out of the goodness of their heart because they cared about their residents as well. well that, that, that too, but I'm just saying, like, there was an actual motivation to do this. For sure. Were, yeah, 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 yeah. And they were put not in steerage, by the way. They were put in the ballast section of ships. Ballast. Um, oh God, worse than steer. It was, you know, it was horrible. What they you called? Were literally ship. dead weight. I'm not saying it was good, but but I guess what I'm saying is that if you, you know. really wanted to get out, you could. Yeah. You'd just probably die in the process, <laughs> and that's you know really horrifying. But but in a lot of these instances in in life in the world, when things begin to get really bad, you need two things. You need to realize when people say it can't keep getting bad, let's just write it out. That that historically has not been true. Sometimes, yeah, it can keep getting bad. And what AI is going to do to the economy for the middle and lower classes, they have no fucking clue what they're getting into right now. It is it is obscene to me that people who are just like, oh, yeah, we'll eventually get like, what is it, like like general pay? I forgot the word. DEI. Oh, universal basic income, UBI. Yeah, universal, yes. No, that will not happen before things get bad. Um so, and we're going to be dealing with this global economic problem because of fertility rates anyway at around the same time. So, <clears throat> and and what's interesting is a, is a lot of people then come to me and they're like, yeah, but the fertility rate thing isn't really a problem because the AI is replacing all these jobs. And I'm like, but remember, I sort of categorize the jobs into two categories. There is the high productivity category, and then there's the low productivity category. Well, you still need humans for this high productivity category of job, the type that yeah. requires initiative and ability to put everything together. And that's the group of humans that's disappearing the fastest. So, uh, and, and again, I should be clear, I'm not talking about this along like ethnic lines or anything like that. I'm just saying across groups, typically it's the highest productivity cultural units and family units that are decreasing in fertility the fastest. So yeah, it's gonna be bad. So uh, to Simone's point, you need to recognize what we're going into and begin to build the skill set that can get you through it and begin to fortify yourself and your family. Well, yeah, and and your community because doing this in isolation yeah. is not sustainable, really, at least over the long term. If you want a, a long lasting family that survives across generations, you're going to need a strong community that exchanges services, that dates and marries each other, et cetera. I don't think um, it needs to be a geo. Ge graphically locked as it historically needed to be. Hmm. Anyway, love you to death, Simone. This has been a fantastic conversation. I love you so much, Malcolm. I'm glad we're talking again. I missed you. <laughs>